Welcome to Auto Complete, the weekly news digest from CNET's Roadshow. I'm Brian Cooley with Roadshow editor in chief Tim Stevens, and this is only our only our third go, Tim. And I think for you and I, it's only our second time. <laughs> second time actually being together. Even well, I guess we only actually did one together. But yes, yeah. second time actually being digitally together. Anyhow, so it's it's good to be with you again. Yeah, we did Detroit together. That was our inaugural, and then uh, you were on the road uh, briefly. Where were you last episode last week? Yeah, so I was off in, in Monaco at the Monte Carlo Rally. Uh, it was the first event in the 2016 WRC uh, calendar. It was a, a good race, a challenging uh, field for, um, well, a challenging set of conditions for, for the field. Monte Carlo is always interesting because it's an asphalt rally, so they've got paved roads. But it's always icy and snowy, and you never know what you're going to get, basically, when you head out on the stages. So, you know, real cars going really fast on real roads in, in really awful conditions, as it were. So, yeah, there were a lot of crashes, a lot of uh, broken hearts and broken wheels and broken <laughs> suspensions. But it, it was a good event. Yeah, look for a full write-up on the site in the not-too-distant future. That's why Rally remains my favorite kind of racing. Okay, yeah, let's get into our headlines. Uh, Apple's car project, which is, of course, still very amorphous. We don't know a lot about it. It's mostly speculation. But the latest speculation has come from both Apple Insider and the Wall Street Journal saying that they have uh, gotten some kind of rocky road going on. They've put a hiring freeze on what is reported to be almost a 1,000-person team right now. And recently, uh, Steve Zadesky, uh, who's the head of the organization, again, as far as we can tell, uh, has resigned from Apple for personal reasons. So the idea here is that perhaps Apple's running into its first rocky shoals in whatever Project Titan is going to be. Right, and this is all speculation heaped on top of speculation because yeah. nothing is confirmed at this point. We do know that Steve Zadesky worked at, at Apple. Yeah, he came from Ford. He was an engineer there before joining Apple. And the, the, the speculation was that he was heading up this nebulous Project Titan, which is the, the, supposedly the code name for their Apple car, which would be an actual electric self-driving car in theory. Again, none of this is confirmed, so all this is based on rumors and speculation and inside sources and all that good stuff. Um, but yeah, this is a, a really big team, and apparently they are running into the sorts of headaches that, honestly, a lot of people in the auto industry uh, said that they probably yep. would run into. So uh, I think there are some people in Detroit right now kind of chuckling to themselves at uh, saying that this was what everybody expected. But again, we don't really know exactly what's going on, so uh, who knows. But it is interesting to hear that uh, maybe things aren't going as well. And also, um, Johan Jungworth, uh, who was the Mercedes-Benz R&D head in, uh, in Silicon Valley, mm -hmm. He had also gone to Apple, and he has since left Apple and gone to Volkswagen. So I don't know if that's in any way related to this, um, but maybe things yeah, are not there's, so well. Yeah, there's almost been a bit of a revolving door at the head of Project Titan, and uh, it's revolving pretty quickly as well. Yeah. Uh, so that's what's interesting. And Steve Zadesky, who's the most recent to leave the company, again, for personal reasons, he says, not because of anything wrong with Project Titan. Uh, he's a right. former Ford guy, so he comes out of the automotive business. Another rumor, again, this is a rumor, is that they are in talks with BMW to perhaps base this car on the i3 platform to speed development. And the last we'd heard in the speculation mill, and I almost feel bad about all the speculation, but it's all we've got to work with, mm -hmm. Uh, is that they expect to have um, their field trials and lock engineering by end of 2019 has been the uh, the, the estimate uh, to get a car on the market 2020, uh, maybe a little bit after that. So that's kind of the time frame we're working on. Um, what's interesting here is that this is also news coming out at the same time that the head of Daimler, Dieter Zetsche, uh, had recently toured Silicon Valley and just three days ago was telling uh, German press in particular how impressed he was by the progress that's been made in particular by Google and by Apple in their efforts to become car makers. So he saw something impressive, even while we have these stories now that perhaps uh, Apple, at least, is, is running into some hurdles uh, in, in becoming a car maker. Right, and we don't know exactly what he saw, but he, he did come back and basically start to sound the warning knell to the European manufacturers, which is kind of interesting, that ultimately they need to raise their game or they're going to get left behind, which is something that a lot of Silicon Valley insiders have been saying for a long time, and a lot of people who cover the startup industry who think that you know, Silicon Valley is going to become basically the new Detroit in the U.S. It's all very early to, to make any sort of dire predictions on that front, but it was very interesting to, to hear that he left that, um, that, that tour, and he was quite impressed by what he saw. Again, what he saw exactly remains to be seen. Google, of course, we've seen their autonomous cars driving around. They, they look a little bit like, uh, like clown cars, to be honest <laughs> with you. Um, but yeah. it's, it's interesting to point out, I think, that Google doesn't manufacture those cars. In fact, those cars are built in Detroit. Uh, and it remains to be seen what exactly Google wants to do. Um, you know, there's a lot of speculation that maybe Google just wants to be a provider for autonomous systems, and they want to be ultimately involved in that way, but not actually build the cars themselves. Yeah. Whereas, or hearing from Apple, it definitely sounds like they want to be an actual manufacturer of, of automobiles. So... 
And coming on the heels of all the speculation this week that Apple needs its next iPhone desperately, it right. makes this automotive division that much more interesting and not so much something that could be the next Apple TV, but that really could be, if not the next iPhone, something of that caliber because that's the entire buzz on Wall Street this week is, okay, Apple's become even more top-heavy of an mm -hmm. iPhone company and iPhone seems to have hit its ceiling for the foreseeable future, which makes this story that much more interesting. Dieter Zetsche of Daimler said, our impression, these are his words, was that these companies, Apple and Google in particular, can do more and know more than we had previously assumed. So he came away there uh, giving them their props for whatever reason. Uh, there may be partnerships involved as well. Clearly, you don't speak that magnanimously <laughs> about someone who is just a uh -huh. competitor. Yeah, but again, everything's happening behind very, very thick closed doors, yeah. and it remains to be seen exactly what's going to come out of all of this. But yeah, we have reached peak iPhone, it seems. You know, everybody knew that there was going to be a point where the market was going to be effectively satura saturated. Um, the Apple Watch is being successful, but it hasn't exactly blown up the way that the iPhone did. And yeah, it was the iPhone that really made Apple into the company that it is today, at least in terms of volume, uh, and they need other markets. So we'll continue to see them make making investments like they did with the acquisition of Beats, um, you know, trying to branch out into other areas. Uh, but cars, uh, it seems to be, you know, at least a longer term vision for a big step forward for Apple. And uh, this is maybe not uh, maybe not good news on that front. Yeah, if you're looking for the next iPhone, it would seem that automotive is one of those places to do it as well as something in the streaming TV business. Here's a place you don't want to go if you're looking to have success in the future. Uh, in the airbag business, if your name happens to be Takata. <laughs> They've added another 5.1 million cars with airbags that are now considered defective to the list in the U.S. that are out there uh, sold and in people's hands. This is the new news this week. The 11th death now to add to the list of 10 already uh, has now been reported as likely related to Takata and this is um, happening in a Ford that we'll talk about in a moment. Um, and there is now apparently uh, these bad Takata airbags in cars as late as 2014 models. This was uh, thought of as something in, in cars that were older and now it mm -hmm. seems to be as recently as just a model year back this would bring us to 24.5 million actually before this we were at 24.5 million cars out there with bad airbags uh, this i believe would bring us closer to 30 uh, ford is one of the few companies that has so far identified that they're part of the new 5 million with 400,000 04 to 06 rangers and people are always intrigued by what cars on the list and am i driving it and this latest 11th death that is now being attributed to Takata airbags being defective and throwing shrapnel was in an 06 Ranger. And it's, I believe, the first death attributed to a Takata airbag that wasn't in a Honda. All the rest, I believe, mm. were in Honda cars. And this recall also includes Volkswagen, Audi, and Mercedes-Benz, uh, so they are getting pulled into this as well. But yeah, it's another huge increase in the number of cars that need to be recalled, uh, and it ultimately resulted in us having the worst year ever in terms of recalls last year, uh, which right. was also some kind of sad news we had coming out of uh, coming out of this week. But, um, but yeah, it's, it's just another terrible um, terrible addition to the story. It makes you wonder if indeed we are at the end now or if there will be more models identified going forward. Yeah. That we don't know. I know a lot of folks uh, email us and say, you know, where, where's this going to end? When am I going to know for sure if I've got a car that has a bad airbag or not? Because as we keep hearing these other shoes drop, people say, okay, well, I don't know where the limit is. I don't know if I'm driving a bomb on wheels right now. Right. So we, we stay on top of this story for you and let you know. But the latest edition that we know of is 5 million more cars within that 400,000 04 to 06 Ford Rangers, and that's uh, that's in a recall now, and your Ford dealer would have information on that. Speaking of Ford, uh, if you think auto start stop is just for little weenie green cars or is still kind of a niche thing that the Germans love to put in their cars, uh, forget about that. Uh, Ford is about to go wall-to-wall, -wall, auto start stop on any of their F-150s that have EcoBoost, which is more than half of all the F-150s they sell. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that this may even uh, be coming to the Raptor as well because we're talking about getting turbocharged motors on That's there right. for the first time, which would be an interesting uh, <laughs> yeah. interesting contrast. Auto Raptor, start stop on a Raptor. Yeah, the Raptor's the big, big brawny off-roader racing truck, and it will has a little bit of fuel economy uh, knowledge mixed in there. But, uh, you know, a couple of years ago, I think this would have been a problem because the, the early auto stop start systems were pretty clunky, and, you know, they were not, um, they weren't really very good when it came to driving dynamics. But now, you know, they're so quick and so seamless. I don't know. I don't really see this as being an issue. Does this, does this bother you, Brian? No, I and mean, especially when Ford has mentioned, if I have this right, that uh, when you're in, um, when you're off-road in any of the off-road mm -hmm. terrain modes, I believe when you're towing as well, Auto start stop is automatically defeated. So for folks that really drive their trucks like trucks, you know, they're saying, wait a minute, I don't want power coming and going when I'm, you know, off road or pulling a big old payload. This this would be automatically defeated. You wouldn't even, as I understand it, even have to press the button. So they're recognizing that real truck use sometimes says, no, I want the engine staying on so I've got complete tractability. 
Um, yeah, and that's good. And that makes perfect sense. And I think ultimately it, it shouldn't be a problem. I, again, it's not the kind of thing that these systems are so advanced at this point that you hardly even notice it, except that, of yep. course, things get a lot more quiet at the red lights. Right. Uh, but yeah, I, I, don't think, I don't think this will be an issue for anybody, and especially with them being disabled automatically in towing modes and that kind of thing. I think it'll be ultimately a good thing for everybody. Oh, and by the way, in the next episode of CNET on Cars, that is episode 82, we have a CarTech 101 on how auto start stop works, and you can find that as part of Roadshow at theroadshow.com, or you can shortcut right into it at cnetoncars.com. Now, we talk a lot about these kind of efficient cars with auto start stop or with greater electrification, but you know a lot of them are pretty pricey. A legislator in California has what could become a controversial idea on getting them into more hands of people that don't make a lot of money. Uh, it's an assemblyman from Whittier in Southern California, and in the California Assembly, he's putting out a brand new bill that was introduced yesterday to uh, try and make it easier for low-income people to buy cars that are zero emissions, particularly those cars that have either plug-in or pure electric battery powertrains. His reasoning is, yes, there is a nice federal and California state uh, credit to bring down the price by about $10,000 combined. But he says that the price of the car is still too high to even get into these vehicles, which all start at thirty grand after credits and then go way up from there. He says we need a state program to reduce the MSRP and let you capture the credit on top of that. So in other words, he wants to see these cars come down into, you know, Toyota Corolla price range effectively uh, after lots of credits, including, including a new one that would actually reduce the MSRP for low-income people. And this could help uh, in a lot of ways. Of course, older cars are exempt from emissions regulation or at least have much uh, yeah. more lenient emissions Yeah, pre-75, 75 and earlier here in California. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that just means that ultimately those cars that are still on the road and still limping along are putting a lot of pollution up in the air. So certainly getting those cars off the road would help in terms of making the air cleaner. But also, of course, you know, getting people into newer cars would help the economy. You know, more people buying more cars yeah. uh, would definitely help to get more money into the into the economy. Uh, so that could be a good thing as well. And, you know, we saw a lot of success from Cash from Clunkers. This obviously would be a much smaller program, uh, but ultimately it could help to get some of those cars off the road that are doing the worst pollution uh, and also uh, get more money into dealers' hands. That's right. Cash for Clunkers was a big hit. I mean, that got tapped into real fast. Yeah. Helped to really reinvigorate the auto industry during the down, the down part of the economy. What I was thinking about here is if you're going to incentivize um, people of low income to buy advanced technology cars, Nice idea. Good idea. Uh, do you want to incentivize these low emissions cars or is it almost better to incentivize them to be able to afford cars that have advanced driver assist for safety? Because I'm thinking a lot of people that don't have much money are also driving older cars that have maybe not even anti-lock brakes and stability control, let alone things like forward emergency braking and things of that nature. I'm wondering where would, you know, what's better for society? Where do you put the money on emissions or on safety? <laughs> Yeah, that's a very good point. Uh, cars that were just you know ten years older have much worse, even passive safety systems when it comes to you know crash structures and airbags and things like that compared to what we have yep. today. And, and, and of course, you mentioned the active safety system as, as well. We just got a new uh, result from the IIHS today, a new survey that shows that um, those active safety systems, automatic braking, and even collision, uh, collision warning systems, have a huge impact—a forty percent decrease in, in, in collisions in those cars that have those systems. Yes. So you know that's that's a massive uh, savings of life and 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 ultimately, you know, inconvenience and everything else that comes along with crashing cars. Um, so, yeah, I can definitely see that having a, a greater impact in having cars that have those active safety systems. You know, th the good thing is this bill would ultimately uh, kill two birds with one stone, even if one bird is, just happens to be flying nearby and getting caught up in this. You know, <laughs> yeah, your right. car would have better safety systems regardless. Which is great, um, but yeah, I think in terms of the immediate impact, it's it's you, you got to say that active safety systems are much more valuable to the health and well-being of your average driver uh, than than the emissions coming out of the tailpipe. Yeah, I guess there's more social benefit. I guess it's easier to sell at the legislature to say, look, sure. we're going to clean up California's air as right. opposed to Especially. we're going to save a few thousand people's lives. Uh, it's a broader uh, broader story, but boy, I'd sure like to see people get into cars that have advanced. Safety, like you mentioned, even 10 years ago, cars were night and day. Stability control alone has fundamentally changed the way that people survive accidents out on roads, right. especially yeah. in SUVs and trucks. And things like um, the active lane avoidance systems that we're seeing in more and more cars. Given the number of people I see driving in California texting on their phones while they're driving, <laughs> uh, that would be a nice thing to have, too. You noticed that, did you? I did yeah. a few times. Uh, this is an interesting one uh, to people that really want to be on the cutting edge and merge technology in their car. BMW has just started supporting If This Then That. So this is a, a BMW Labs add-on. I'm not familiar with how this program works. I don't have a BMW, so I haven't been able to try it. <laughs> but they're the first car maker that will let you go connect IFTT uh, to your 
via your your connected services in the dash of your BMW, so you can create macro commands on IFTT that you can operate from your car. Uh, and again, it's it's truly a labs thing like you might do in your Chrome browser or something where they say, look, all bets are off. This may be rough. This may not work all the time. But of course, it's not going to touch powertrain or drive controls. Right. That's the first time I've seen an automaker put something in the car like that and say, hey, this this might actually crash. Uh, you know, I've never actually <laughs> in that yeah, been, in, in, in the lowercase C. Sense. Right. Yeah. And I, I've been there uh, in cars and have had infotainment systems, you know, give me error messages and things like that. But ultimately, I've never actually had the, the manufacturer come up front and say, hey, this is something we're trying out. Give it, mm -hmm. give it a spin if you want to. But if you're not familiar with if this and that, but it basically it's a really advanced means of triggering activities in your phone. So you can say, when I get to this area that's located on a GPS coordinate, uh, send it an email to my wife that I've picked up the kids from school. Uh, or when I get home, you know, start up this Spotify playlist, that kind of thing. Um, you can do a lot of really advanced stuff and to have that tied into your car now is pretty interesting because you can then have other things that are based on your location in the car. If you have a smart garage door opener, for example, you can have the garage door opener automatically open for you when you pull into your street. Um, pretty interesting stuff like that. Yeah, I haven't had a chance to play with it either. I'm curious to see how seamless it is. Of course, a lot of this is going to be based on the accuracy of the GPS and everything else, but uh, yeah. it's a pretty cool idea. Yeah, it's pretty amazing what you can do. Once you start pulling other services into your car's nav system, there's a whole lot of interesting things you can do, like you're mentioning. Uh, so th this, there's some real power here. This isn't uh, this isn't a, a gimmicky thing, I don't think. So anyway, if you're, a, if you're a Beamer driver and your car's got connected drive services and BMW Online, you have to have those two technologies in your car, which is pretty common on the last model year or two. You can then go to labs.bmw w.com and you'll find the information on how to connect your car to your ifttt account uh which you have to have already and then start playing with it and if you do that let us know uh send us uh, send us email to um what is our email for roadshow Oh, we've got lots of emails. Probably the best one is tips at the roadshow.com. You can send us anything you like through there. That'd be a great way to do it. And yeah, we would love to see what you're up to, especially videos of your garage door opening automatically and things like yeah. that. We'd love to see. <laughs> garage door via geo boundary would be very mm -hmm. cool to see. Tips at the roadshow.com. We're going to come back in just a moment. We got more for you here on Autocomplete Episode 3, including the possible return of the much loved diminutive Opal GT and what Xerox is doing with a transportation app that is the first ever when Autocomplete continues. Welcome back to Autocomplete, the technology and automotive news show from Roadshow at theroadshow.com. I'm Brian Cooley with Roadshow Editor-in-Chief Tim Stevens. Before we get back in the headlines, Tim, what's new at the site? Well, we've got a lot of great stuff coming up this week. We've had a, a lot of great news, some beautiful pictures of the new Jaguar F-Type SVR, a ridiculously high horsepower version of that car, way more power. The R-Type was already massively overpowered, so, but who, who cares? Let's get more power in there. Sure, why not? Uh, we've also got uh, some great reviews coming up, and also there'll be a feature on um, basically talking with GM's head of cybersecurity about how they're securing their cars and how they're being more adaptive to all the sorts of exploits and hacks that we're seeing. Uh, look for that feature on the site, as well as, Brian, our shootout of the best luxury sedans. If all goes well, we should have that up on the site this week as well. Uh, Brian and I had a lot of fun testing out the BMW 7 Series and the Mercedes-Benz S-Class. And uh, who wins? Well, you'll have to tune in to find out. Yeah, that wasn't the worst duty we've ever had. That was pretty comfortable, yeah. I must say. That was pretty good. Okay, back into our headlines. Uh, speaking of coming cars, here's one that's down the road a ways, but it's going to take you back. Uh, Tim, you remember the Opal GT, right? I do. A beautiful, beautiful little roadster. Kind of look like a little shrunken down early 70s Corvette. Absolutely gorgeous. Yeah, it's, it's absolutely a beautiful car. One of the most beautiful Opals, if not the most beautiful Opal uh, that ever hit the Yeah, you don't hear Opal uh, and Beautiful mentioned mm -hmm. a whole lot. Not although, very often, no. <laughs> no. Not much. So this is going to be something uh, very tasty out there. Uh, we've got some uh, a great slideshow of this over at Roadshow and a few photos that I think we're showing you right now of this uh, concept, obviously. Right. But uh, brought along with a one liter inline three in, in today's current engineering fashion, but still delivering 145 horse to a car that comes in not much over two thousand pounds um and has definitely the old opal gt dna dramatically brought forward but there's no mistaking what they're hearkening back to yeah it looks absolutely gorgeous it's the first car i think i've ever seen where the, the body color actually matches the color of the tires it's got two red front <laughs> tires yeah, which that. is 
the first time I've I've seen colored tires on cars before, but I've never seen it coordinated in such a way. I think it looks fantastic. Yeah, I'm yeah. I'm absolutely in love with this concept. It's you know a little two seater. It's um, it's front mid engine, so the engine's situated well back, but it is a front engine car, a long no well long relatively long nose, and given to the proportions mm-hmm. of the car, which is very very small. Uh, the one thing is, I'm not sure exactly how you get into the car. The doors seem to flow right into the fenders, which is interesting. Maybe it's like a childhood Zen sci-fi kind of thing, where the doors are sort of open for you when you get there. But uh, no mirrors, of course, as is the oh, uh, of course not, de, no. de rigueur for concepts these days. Yeah. It's got cameras instead of mirrors. But yeah, absolutely lovely concept. And it's a GM product, so in theory, if it were to be built, maybe it could come here as a Chevy, maybe, probably not. But uh, it is a beautiful thing. Yeah, so check out the full slideshow over at theroadshow.com. Uh, Xerox has a new uh, transportation app that does some interesting things here. It rolls up, they say, for the first time, and as far as I know, it's for the first time, every possible way you can get around and sorts those routes by every possible concern you might have. So here's what it does. It's launching in LA. It's called Go LA is the app. And what it does is it takes in how you might get there by walking, riding a bike, driving your car, driving a car share, taking public transit, or taking any of the TNCs like Lyft or Uber. And it's able to seam those all together into a route plan. I don't think anyone's ever pulled all of those together into a route plan. You can do it on Google or Waze and you get, you know, basically transit, walking, biking. But no one rolls in every possible way into a single optimized trip. And you can optimize for getting there fastest, getting there cheapest, or getting there the most green method. This is this is pretty interesting stuff they're doing with data here. Yeah, it's great. We hear a lot about multimodal transportation these days, which is basically getting you from A to B, even if A to B involves multiple means of transportation, like you were just discussing. And Volkswagen and a few other manufacturers have played with with in-car navigation systems that can kind of hand off to your smartphone when you get out of the car. But nothing anywhere near as advanced as this in terms of rolling together everything from public transit to Uber and Lyft, as you mentioned. And ultimately, also then categorizing that based on cost and, and efficiency is is pretty amazing stuff. It's unfortunate that it's only in LA. I'm guessing there's a lot of uh, you know hooks that need to be programmed to make something like this work. Yeah. It's also interesting that it's coming from Xerox. You know, Xerox, of course, was a huge pioneer in the technology industry for a long time. Uh, and it's pretty cool to see this coming from them. Yeah, I think this comes out of their uh, their park, their Palo Alto Research Center in mm-hmm. Silicon Valley. What this doesn't have, which is a big glitch right now, is even though it may say, okay, this leg of your trip should be Uber or Lyft, you can't book the Uber or Lyft in the app yet. Mm-hmm. They say that's coming as well as the payment platform. So they have to go get, as you mentioned, they have to get those hooks from Uber to bring into the app to allow it to become part of the actual booking and transaction system at, at Uber and Lyft. But it's 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 largely baked, and if you want to play with it, it's over at golaapp.com, and it is out already for iOS and Android. We've driven cars that have uh, adaptive gas pedals before. Infinity has something called Eco Pedal. If you're if you're goosing it too hard and wasting gas, the pedal will push back and keep you from dumping too much fuel for a given driving scenario. But this is more advanced. We've got one here coming from Bosch that is almost like a haptic game controller in in the variety of things it can do. Right. It can, uh, of course, I- I increase resistance as well. So if you have a heavy right foot, they can d- deliver you a heavy pedal to match that. But uh, it can also vibrate uh, much like a uh, an ABS sensor might vibrate the brake pedal, for example, and it can basically kick the pedal back at you as well to give even more stern feedback if it needs to, which is interesting. <laughs> um, so, yeah, you can imagine the car kind of pushing back if you are asking for a little bit too much and driving in too uh, inefficient a way. Uh, y- you know, the easiest way to get better fuel economy from your car is just to go a little bit easier on the right pedal, and this could be another way, you know, better than vines growing on your dashboard and lights blinking at yeah, you and right. things like that. This might be a little bit more easy for a lot of people to understand and maybe maybe more effective. I think it's a great, simple idea. You know, the cost... Probably not adding a lot of cost in terms of, of technology here, but I think it actually would be quite effective for a lot of drivers. Yeah, and it's interesting, like you mentioned, it could give you a, a pedal that is aimed at efficiency, but it could also give you a pedal that gives you the right feel for performance driving. Yeah. Uh, they mentioned how it could be interfaced with the sensors around the car, so as you're heading into a corner and if you're giving it too much or you need to give it more, which a lot of drivers are hesitant to mm-hmm. power through a corner, this might almost encourage you with a lighter pedal to, to dip in deeper into the power. A lot of things. Once you make that pedal smart, you can kind of go anywhere with it. Um, and, and again, it's also sort of um, the ultimate way to handle both performance and efficiency. So Bosch is developing that, and of course, they'll be shopping it to car makers. One of the places where you love to get into the pedal is, of course, a Dodge Viper, which production is ending uh, next year. And Viper aficionados, of course, are, are very sad about that. They only sold, like, I think 600 of them last year. It's a, you know, it's a, very, yeah. it's a low seller for them. But mm-hmm. uh, Sergio Marchion, the head of Fiat Chrysler, is once again saying, you know, we may bring it back, but on a different platform from Alpha. And, uh, and we love the performance cars that Alpha's putting out these days. Yeah, absolutely. Marcion had a lot to say this week on a lot of different topics, including that they're going to be building a lot more trucks and Jeeps and all sorts of other things. But yeah, this was, uh, you know, 
maybe some encouraging news for the future. The, the Viper, unfortunately, the current gen, while you know a beautiful car and, and continuing that great Viper lineage, ultimately has not been a big sales success and has been kind of a, a tough sell when you look at things like the, the Corvette, which is offering very nearly the same level of performance for a lot less money. Uh, and yeah. there are... Uh, other issues, safety-related issues, you can't get enough airbags in the Viper, things like that. So um, Viper, it sounds like, does need a new platform, and maybe, indeed, we'll get something based on uh, something like the Julia, for example, which we yeah. are still waiting on. The Julia, unfortunately, part of that news also this week, that the Julia is going to be delayed until next year now in the U.S., which is really unfortunate. Um, but who knows? Alpha's doing some great things. They make some beautiful cars, and uh, maybe they can make a nice new front-engine rear-drive platform that can handle a big beastly V10 from the U.S. Yeah, I'm sure it just galls Viper owners to know to no end that their car is ending because of side curtain airbags <laughs> of all the things right? yeah of all the ways that you can die in a viper uh <laughs> right. about the airbags yeah it seems like a, it seems like a minor thing but it, sure. it is a shame the, the styling on the new viper i think is fantastic the driving yeah. dynamics of course are fantastic so it's it is a bit of a shame uh interesting uh, note here for those of you that are wondering you know what cars are made in england anymore well a lot of cars are made in england about one and a half million a year but one of the rising stars is jaguar land rover after a lot of rough years in the last decade uh new 2015 numbers for you jaguar land rover lovers be proud uh, they are now the number one british car maker that actually makes cars in the UK, they're up 3% last year. They now make uh, nearly half a million cars a year in England under the Jaguar Land Rover line. A huge part of that growth came from the U.S. We are in love with UK-made cars. We bought 27% more of them in the United States in 2015 than we did from the year before. Uh, big gain, and so Jaguar Land Rover has overtaken Nissan as the biggest uh, UK-based automaker, you know, actually creating products there. Yeah, the, the new uh, F-Type from Jaguar is amazing. The new XC looks fantastic. And this year we have the new F-Pace, which is going to be their compact SUV, which uh, should be on the market before the end of the year. And it's hard to imagine that thing not selling well also. So, uh, you know, things should just continue to be looking up for Jaguar in particular. And then, of course, Land Rover is doing a lot of great things, too. Uh, the new SVR uh, is a pretty amazing package and a big SUV. So a lot of great products coming out of there. And certainly, yeah, we're seeing a bit of a renaissance for the love for British motoring. I have a Triumph motorcycle myself, so I mm. can appreciate <laughs> Not wasted on Tim, by no nope, means. Nope, not at all. Uh, let's wrap up with a tip of our hat to our uh, to our friends in Detroit. Interesting, this is not about a car, but about an iconic building in the biggest car city in America, and that is the Renaissance Center, which uh, everyone knows as these multiple cylindrical towers right there in the heart of Detroit. It's been General Motors headquarters for uh, a couple decades. About to get a big redo uh, there on the front of this iconic building in Detroit, uh, including a, a 70 by 80 foot video wall, a completely new transit station in front, and most interesting to us is that they're going to create a whole new uh, what they call GM world inside where they currently have a lot of their cars displayed but I'll be honest it's not it's not a great layout um, and they're going to redo that whole area uh, we've seen some renderings that we have some photos of we're showing you right now um, and that would create a place that it, it occurred to me Tim are they thinking about having a daily display of cars which I'm sure they are that is much cooler than the current one but are they also going to take a turn like Apple and Samsung and others and say, you know what, we need to have our own events and do major unveils that aren't at auto shows as well? It makes a lot of sense. We're certainly seeing that that trend where more and more manufacturers and ultimately, you know, large companies of all shapes and sizes is making all sorts of products saying that we don't need to go to these big industry events anymore. We can do our own thing. Uh, and ultimately, you know, that could be a productive thing for them. If only, even if they do piggyback on top of the Detroit Auto Show or that kind of thing, to have a nice place they can own and basically control the entire experience. Um, that, that remains to be seen, but ultimately this does, or it could give them an opportunity to connect with, with buyers on, on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, if they create a nice place people can wander into, can go through the museum, to see what kind of new products are coming out on the market, and then just go in and have a coffee even and check out the new Malibu or whatever without having to go to a dealership. Yeah. That, again, could be a great thing, especially for the downtown area of Detroit. So the Rent Center is, you know, this kind of futuristic-looking building, despite the fact that it is getting up there in its age. But it's also a very confusing building to get around. <laughs> yes. I know you've spent some time in there as well. It's very easy to get lost in the Rent Center. So I hope as part of these renovations, they, they do have some kind of a, a means of <laughs> yeah. getting around. Good and point. Yeah, good point. Please improve the navigation of the building while you're busy creating this new front because it is so easy to be in the wrong tower and have no idea how to get to the other towers. It's right. It's like it the should. mall from hell, but it's not a mall.
it should be an easy thing, but it is a very complicated place to get around. But I think this could be do great things for the downtown Detroit area, which is you know getting better and better by every day. And yeah. uh, having having more new cars and also vintage cars on display could make for a really cool place to visit while you're downtown. I didn't know this. Uh, I was doing a little bit of research on that building. That was originally a development by Ford, that building, and General Motors bought it in 96. I always thought of it as forever a GM thing, and I was wondering this morning, who built the Rensen? It was actually a Ford building, and then General Motors purchased it. Um, yeah, I didn't know that either. That was actually pretty surprising to, to me to learn. I, I always think of it, whenever you go to Detroit during the auto show, they always have a picture of whatever car is coming out. This year they had the Malibu printed on the side of the building with giant headlights beaming yeah. out. It's just sort of iconic as a GM product to me. So it was interesting to learn that this was actually Ford at one point. But, you know, I guess it shows how tight the families are there in Detroit. Still on. Auto Town. All right. Okay, that's it for Autocomplete Episode 3. I'm Brian Cooley with Tim Stevens, Editor-in-Chief of Roadshow. Stay on top of everything going on with automotive, technology, and culture at the site that maybe you haven't discovered yet, but you absolutely need to, theroadshow.com, the brand-new car destination from CNET. We'll see you guys next week with the latest news in the automotive world.